Monday. Okay, so uh, here we have the practical, and uh, just as a reminder, what we had in our test tube, we had, remember, the enzyme catalase, so we had catalase solution, and as well as that, we had the pH buffer, and then finally, what you added was the hydrogen peroxide to start the reaction hydrogen peroxide broken down into <clears throat> um, oxygen and water and the produced oxygen um, resulted in an increase in gas pressure in the boiling tube and this caused the gas to move through the delivery tube and into the me measuring cylinder which was full with water and then every 30 seconds you were making an observation of how much gas was produced. So every second, every 30 seconds, you were recording what the volume of gas was in the measuring cylinder, being the same volume of gas that's produced in this uh, reaction catalyzed by catalase. And then what you did was, you re so you collected that data in your table, and you repeated the experiment at different pHs. So we had pH 4, we had pH 5, we had pH 7, and instead of pH 8, we had pH 9. So these were the, um, that, that was basically your experiment. And now what I would like you to do is complete the data analysis for that. So um, I've got a sample set of data. Uh, obviously your, your write-up has to be based on your data. Um, However, what you do with that data, I will show you using the data that I have. Okay, so once, as you were collecting your data, um, you should have had a table. So I'll just review quickly what that table should have looked like and why it looked that way. Um, your table, remember very roughly, obviously you use a ruler, but your table always should have your independent variable going down the left side column. Okay, and remember, your independent variable is the thing that you are investigating, and usually it's the thing that you, it's the factor that you are changing during the course of your um, investigation. Okay, so the factor that we were investigating in this case, what we were changing from experiment to experiment was the pH. So, going down here, we would have pH 4, pH 5, pH 7, and pH 9. What goes across is the thing that we are measuring the effect of the independent variable on. Okay? So, in this case, we were looking, we were investigating the effect of pH on the enzyme catalyzed breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. The way we were measuring that was the oxygen production, and that is what our dependent variable is. So the dependent variable goes across here. In this case, it was volume of oxygen produced. centimeters cubed. All right, now, because we weren't just, um, we weren't just measuring at one time point, we were measuring the volume of oxygen produced after every 30 seconds. Okay, so what was the total volume of oxygen produced after a specific time? So we would need 30 seconds, we would need 60 seconds, 90, 120, 150, 180, 10, and however long that y you wanted it to go to, um, all the way up until five minutes. That's what I said in the lesson, wasn't it? So that's one minute, that's two minutes, that's three minutes, 2, 10, 2, 
40, that's 4 minutes, and to 70, and 300 should take us to 5 minutes. So, um, that, these are all seconds, so in seconds. Okay, so, and then as you were recording your data, you would have been filling out these boxes going across for each of your pH experiments. And there you would have had your data. So what I'm going to do is very quickly um, put some data in here, some sample data from one of the students in, in, in your uh, cohort and we'll proceed doing our analysis from that point. So, while we're here at this point looking at the data generated from the experiment, I just want to point out the level of accuracy that you need to record your information, at, especially when using uh, volume measurements, okay? So, we were using a measuring cylinder, and this measuring cylinder had graduations two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, of, I think it was in going up in 20s. So 20, 40, and 60. This was our measuring cylinder in centimeters cubed, obviously. Okay, now. Looking at this data, in the, uh, looking at this data, the reason why this data is good is because it is the correct level of accuracy. So, what you are required to do, the level of accuracy that's needed, is that you should be able to obviously read the any measurement that falls on one of these grades, one of these graduations. You should be able to read. So you you should be able to read twenty centimeters cubed, you should be able to read 22 centimeters cubed because they are indicated, because they're indicated right here, all right? So these ones, you should be able to read any volume that falls on those. However, you should also be able to go one step further and be able to say if it's not 20 and if it's not 22, the level of accuracy that you, you need is to be able to say, well, if it's not here, and if it's not here, then if it falls anywhere in the middle, you should be able to call that 21 centimeters cubed. Okay, similarly, if we were, if we were on a different scale, so let's just change that for a second, and let's just say that we were using a different measuring cylinder, with, and it said 1 here, and it said 2 here, and it said 3 here, the level of accuracy that you should be able to uh, read to would be to say if that, if, 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 it's, if it's this, so if it's here, then you can read one centimeters cubed, fine. If it's not there and it's there, you should be able to read 1.2 centimeters cubed, but if it's not 1.0, and if it's not 1.2, you should be able to say, if it's anywhere in the middle, then I'm going to call it 1.1 centimeters cubed. So the point is that whenever you do these kind of uh, experiments, you are not, you are not um, free to choose whatever level of accuracy you feel comfortable with. You must um, uh, be able to... Uh, record your data to a level of accuracy as determined by the equipment that you're using. Okay, so this is very important. You should be able to literally read between the lines there, guys. So, there you go. Bit of humor in there for you. Um, let's carry on. Okay, so as we can see, this data is good. It meets those requirements because not only does it have our straightforward even numbers that we would have been reading from the measuring cylinder, it does have the occasional odd number showing that whoever was looking, generating this data was doing so with a good level of accuracy. 
Okay, let's proceed now. What do we do with this data? And you need to pay attention here because, again, um, there are certain rules and conventions we need to follow when plotting this data on a graph. So uh, the screen doesn't let me show you the whole page, which is slightly annoying. But um, if I was to just redraw, let's just say that this was our page. Yeah, roughly A4 proportions. So let's say that was our full um, sheet of paper. The rules that we must follow when drawing a graph is that you try and get try and get your y-axis on the longest edge of the paper, okay? Because the, the more space you use to plot your um, y-axis, the more accurately you can um, plot the data. And remember that on, on your x scale, you're going to have um, time, and time wasn't really the thing that we were measuring. Okay, time was pre predefined for us at very uh, specific intervals of thirty seconds. Okay, so you know we're not really looking at how accurately we can plot time here. We're looking at how accurately we can plot our result, and the result was oxygen, uh, the volume of oxygen produced. Um, or collected in the measuring cylinder, that's where we need to be accurate. And so that would, it would make sense for us to put that on the longest axes, or it would make sense to put that on the longest sides of the page, side of the page. And that's why usually you never, ever, ever do your um, uh, graph in landscape mode. You want to keep it portrait. Because you know the the, in, the thing of interest in this case is the oxygen volume, and that's what should go on the longest side of the page. Okay, so I'm going to actually go through the process with you, so you know how to do things. Um, again, this has to correspond with your data, so there's no point just copying what I'm doing. Okay, now. Going across is the easiest thing to do for the x-axis. We just put all our times in there. Again, you look for your highest number. You look for the highest number that you're going to have and make sure that at regular intervals um, you can uh, plot the numbers that you need up to and including the highest number. So for us it was 300. So for every minute I have two um, boxes there. So that's another minute. That is another minute there. That's another minute, so that would be four minutes. So that's 90 seconds, 120 seconds, 150 seconds, 180 seconds, 210 seconds, 240 seconds, 270 seconds, and last... 300 seconds. Okay, so I've taken up most of the space. I've got my highest number in there, and all the numbers go up in regular intervals. Okay, so that's the x axis. Now we deal with the y axis. So for this, I need to look at my data, right? And I'm looking for I'm looking for where is my highest number because my I need to be able to plot my highest number. So the highest number that I can see here is um, 40. Okay, uh, do, 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 just have a quick check on 42 there. It's going to be on the end, isn't it, the highest number? So out of all these numbers, um, 42 is the highest. So my y-axis needs to be able to go to 42 and um, go up in, again, regular intervals. So how do I do that? Um, a general rule is that we can use these um, boxes as a guide, okay? So, starting here at 0, and I need to go to 42. So, how many boxes do I have? I'll just give that a quick count. I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen seems reasonable. Sixteen multiple of four. I need to be able to go up to, I don't know, forty, forty-two, forty-five. So if I say that that one, two, three, four, that would be forty-five, wouldn't it? Okay, so that's what I will do. So I will say that if that is ten and then therefore that is 20, that has to be 30, that would have to be 40, and this right here would be 42.5, wouldn't it? Yep. So that should be fine. So that's what I'm going to do. Or I could cheat a little bit and change my page size. You guys obviously can't do that. Okay. But this is the process by which you work. So, I've got a bit more paper here. but um, 40 and extend this up a bit more. So, 40. So, this would be 45. Okay. So that would be 35, that would be 25, that would be 15, that would be 5. And then from there, I, I can work out what, what 1 would be when the time requires it. Okay? So what we're thinking here is that, right, if that's 20 and... If this is 25 and that's 20, then we want to be able to break it down until we get to the ones and then further on. So then that will be 21. No. No, that wouldn't. So we've got 10 spaces here. So each four squares would be one. So, so that right there would be 21. That would be 22. That would be 23. That would be 24, that would take me to 25, and so on. Okay, so this is, this is kind of how we do it. So once I've got my graph, I need to plot the data. Okay. Okay, guys, so let's now plot the data. So on this side here, I've got my uh, results, and I will start with... I will start with pH 4, and so at pH 4, at 30 seconds, I had 10, so I'm going across to 30 seconds here, and then I'm going up to 10. I know this might be obvious for many of you, but if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. So, so across 30, and then up 10, and this is important about plotting graphs. We are going to not use colors, but we are going to use symbols to identify the different data sets. So while I'm doing pH 4, my pH 4 data set, I'm going to use um, circles around a point. Uh, when I do pH 5, I will do a point with, you know, maybe just a cross like that. When I do pH 7, I will go like this. When I do pH 8, I might just mix things up a little bit, go crazy, and do it with a point and a square. But in, either ca in all cases, I'm not relying on color, uh, okay? And in all cases, you can see that for all of them, I am using a point. So for each of these points, I can see exactly which part of the graph that it is referring to because its center is marked very clearly by either a point or a cross, okay? So I'm not doing something like this where the central region, so if, if I use just simply a triangle, I don't know what part of that triangle um, the data is referring to, whereas if I put a point in that triangle, then at least I know that's the data. That's, 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 the, that's the 
point on the graph that I am trying to indicate. Okay, so let's get on with this. Uh, what did I say? I'm going to use circles, right? So three and ten. There we go, that's right there. And then the next, that's 60 seconds, it was 18. So 60, again 18. So we every four was one, we said. So 15, 16, 17, and 18. So that's my point. Get rid of all this other stuff. Next, at 90 seconds, I've got 24. 90 seconds, I've got 24. So that is there, one of the points that we indicated. Okay. And at 120 seconds, we had 26. 120 seconds, we had 26. So, 25 and each 4 is 1, so that's my point. Okay, and then 20, 150, we had 29. 150, line it up, so it's 1 less than 30, so it would be there. Okay, and 180, we had 30. 180, we have 30. 210, we've got 32, 210, so that's 30, and then another 4, and then another 4, so that's my point. And that was 210, 240 was 33, 240 was 30. And 270 was 34, 270, 35, 4 squares less than 35, there we go. And 300 was 36, 300 was 36, line it up, 35, 1 more than 35, 4 squares. Okay, that's done. That is our data okay so and then I'll just make my key so I don't forget this is the data for pH 4 job done all in black and white no colors needed now things are gonna get tricky guys okay because what we need to do here is draw a line or a curve of best fit okay that must go through point zero it must go through point zero right there, must go through point zero, it must generally fit the points, but the key point here is it has to have the shape of an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, which always invariably looks like that, okay? Why does it look like that? I'll tell you. So this is the reaction progress, and this is time, the reaction will always go fastest right at the beginning because there are the most number of substrate molecules around with which the enzyme is going to collide. So the, the rate of the reaction, the highest kind of chance for collision between enzyme and substrate is at the beginning. After that first moment, substrate starts to get converted into product. So the number of substrates that are around starts to get less, and so the rate starts to slow down, or the, or the rate starts to lower in a curve. Okay, eventually, there is no substrate left. Only product is around, and so, eventually, the progress of the reaction comes to zero, it levels off completely. Okay, so your curve must look like this, regardless of, um, regardless of whether it exactly matches your data or not. All curves must do, you know, these things. One, it must go through point zero zero. Two, 
it, the rate at the beginning should be the fastest rate possible uh, from the data, okay? And from that point on, the rate must always be going down. There's no speeding up later on just, just to fit your data, even if that's what your data suggests, okay? Let me give you an example, shall I? So, I've got some data, and the data seems to do that. Okay? Now, clearly, the data is not fitting exactly what I would expect an enzyme-catalyzed reaction to do. But I have to make it fit the rules. It has to start at point zero zero. So it has to start at point zero zero. It has to start more steeply um, than it finishes, and it has to be a smooth curve throughout, not, and the rate, sh the slope should not be getting faster at any point. So, the way I would do this curve, the wrong way to do the curve would be to make it try and go through all these points. That's clearly not what the enzyme was doing, okay? Whatever, if these data points don't fit, a curve is because of experimental error, it's not because the enzyme was doing something funny. So, the correct way to plot this curve would be to try and make it go through the points while still satisfying all our rules. So, generally speaking, the curve that I would try to fit would look something like that. Okay, it kind of takes into account the fact that there are points all around here, and it tries to it generally bisect all the points. So I don't have an un... I've got as many points above the line as below the line. It is a curve. It does start off more steeply at the beginning, and by the end, it, the rate has gone down, and there's no point at which it ever speeds up. Okay, so uh, this takes a lot of practice, and it does also take a lot of repeating from the teacher. So hopefully, because it's been recorded forever digitally, you can just listen to me say it over and over and over and over again until you get it right. Okay, but a curve must look like that, like that, like that, or like that or even like this. But it's always some modification of that. The initial rate is always the highest rate, and it always slows down gradually from that point. Okay? Your data is just kind of helping you as to which of these curves um, it is. Okay? So it's just helping you make that choice. Anyway, let's get back to this one then. Um, after having said all that, what line am I going to fit? I'm going to use my black line here and try and get this right. S must start at zero, zero. Go through points if I can, but I'm not going to get obsessed by it. And there I stop. And if I do say so myself, that's pretty sweet. Okay? That's a pretty sweet curve going on right there. Because, roughly speaking, it's got as many points below it as under it. It goes through zero, zero. The rate at the beginning is the steepest rate, and it goes down gradually after that point. You might not, you know, if you had done this experiment for longer, you might have seen it level off. Maybe some people did, um, but that just depends on your experiment. And that's how you plot the data. So, next, you would start plotting your next data set. I would like it on the same graph, please, to give you as much um, space to plot these graphs as you can. So then, you know, I would look at um, my next set of data, which is 5, 30 seconds, pH 5, and it would be 12, so 30 seconds, it's 12, so 4 more, 2 more. There it is, and I said that I would use a cross, didn't I? So there we go, that's a cross right there, and that's my data for pH 5, and then at 60 seconds, I've got 23. At 60 seconds, I've got 21, 2, 3. And so I put a cross right there. Okay? And once I'm done with, with all of those, then I'll fit my next curve to that one. Okay? And that is how you plot 
um, uh, enzyme catalyzed reaction data. Um, and the next thing you must do, or the next important thing um, building on from this, is you want to compare the initial rate um, from, for different pHs. Okay, so here what I have is um, two sets of data plotted, and the next thing that we do is we compare numerically when we can see that perhaps um, the, the enzyme is working at a uh, higher rate um, when the pH is 5 compared to pH 4. But what we do now is we do a numerical analysis of that. So we actually, we don't just base that on what we see, but we actually prove it with numbers. Okay, and the way we do that is by calculating what we call the initial rate. The initial rate, okay? So, remember what we said before, that during an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, the rate is highest at the beginning and then it slows down. That rate at the beginning, that the slope of the line right at the beginning, that's what we call the initial rate. And as we change and vary the conditions of enzymes and they work at different rates, we compare the effect of these different conditions by the effect they have on the initial rate. Okay? So, how do we do that? So, what we do is we put our ruler and pencil on point zero, 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 and I'm going to do it here digitally, you're going to do it with a ruler, we draw a line, okay? Now that line must hug the first part of the curve. So you can see there, I've got my line here, and I'm moving the line, so first we're going to concentrate on the pH 4, so it's this curve right here, okay? Now I'm going to draw a tangent to that line, and it's going to be the point at which the line just touches the first initial part of the curve, okay? So we're looking in this area right here. Keep your eyes there, okay? And my tangent is going to go, it's going to closer, 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 closer to the line, and there it's overlapping it, okay? I'm going to do that again. My tangent, okay? And remember, it's not, it's not the pH 5 line, it's the pH 4 line. Okay, so we're going to, tangent is going to move, 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 until there it's just overlapped the line. So we're drawing a tangent to the initial part of the curve. And that's my tangent to the curve for pH 4. Now I want to calculate the slope of that line, and that is very, um, kind of, that you might be already familiar with how to do that. Okay, so we take some clearly visible points from here. So one point that might be easy to work out is that one right there because it, it you know, it falls on a, a nice um, intersection between uh, some lines there. So right there, that's the point that I choose. And what I do there is then draw a triangle, okay, from that point downwards. Yeah, and this software is not letting me do it completely straight down, so please, apologies for that. All right, but once I've got my right angle triangle there, what I do there is divide, or I look at my axis and work out what is the distance that way. This is what I will call my difference in Y, okay? And I will divide that by my difference difference in x, okay? And in that way, I will see what was the change in volume of oxygen given a certain amount of time, which will give me a rate. You see, it will give me a centimeters cubed of oxygen per second of time. And that will tell me how quickly the enzyme was working um, or what was the initial rate for pH 4, uh, or for catalase at pH 4. Okay, so 
Um, shall we just go ahead and do that for this example? So I'll switch back to black. And perhaps I'll get rid of all this stuff. And so if I look on my axes there, I'll, I'll figure out my... So my dy is equal in this case. My dy is equal to about 25... 26, 25 there, 26, 26.5, 26 26.5 26 or 26.25, because every four squares is one, so I've got one square extra, so it's 26.25 is my dy, that's the change in y that I've got from my tangent, so that's the slope of my tangent, okay, so yeah, so just write that down, it's the slope of the tangent is equal to the initial the initial rate. So my dy is 26.5 centimeters cubed of oxygen and losing it slightly dx. What's my change in time? So it took how long did it take to produce or how long would it have taken at that rate to produce 26.25 centimeters cubed of gas? I look on my x-axis now, um, looking at that, I'm looking at 30, 60, I've got to work this out now, so every, uh, I've got 30 seconds there, and I've got 10 little squares, so each square is equivalent to 3 seconds, so I've got 60, 63, 66, 69, 72, 275, 75 seconds, I'm going to call that, guys. So my difference in x is 75 seconds, and so my dy over dx is equal to 26.25 divided by 75, which is equal to... Do, 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 do. 0 0.35, 0 0.35 centimeters cubed of oxygen per second. Okay, um, and that is my initial rate for equals initial rate for pH four. So for catalase working at pH four, its initial rate under the conditions that we used is 0.35 centim centimeters squared per second. And what we would do then is we would repeat that for pH 5, we would repeat that process for pH 7. Yes, the graph would get a little bit busy, but I'm sure you can negotiate that. And if you, if you don't want it to get too busy, then don't draw many graphs on one graph paper. Use separate graph papers to draw your separate graphs um, using the same axes for accuracy and, and reproducibility, and then determine your different initial rates. Okay, and so if I just use a different color here, let's use red. What I do, again, I draw another tangent. So I've got another line here, but this time the line would be moving until it hugs the first part of my first line, which would be maybe around there. Okay, so if I was to work out a rate for that, it would be higher. So... Um, it looks like the enzyme is working higher at pH 5 than it is at pH 4. Okay, but again, we want to be working that out numerically and comparing numbers to each other rather than uh, subjective uh, kind of um, optical uh, opinions, if you will. Next, once... We have our initial rate, so um, what we'll be planning to do then is to have some kind of table where we have um, pH here, pH 4, pH 5, pH 7, and pH 9. Once we've done that, I would like you to um, make a, a table that compares pH to the initial rate. So for our first example, we would have 0.35 um, units should go here. So initial rate in centimeters cubed per second. Okay, and then we'd have point, 0.35, we would have whatever at 0.5, whatever at points, uh, pH 7, whatever at pH 9. And then 
comes the second graph. And this, I'll do that again. And this is where things should get interesting. Again, I'm just doing this roughly. You would take the whole page if you can to do this. When we have then pH versus initial rate, we should start to see something quite familiar. If everything's gone well, and I can't guarantee that it did for you, okay, but if everything has gone well, we should see, possibly, that at, you know, extreme pHs of 4, the activity was perhaps lower, it got higher at 5, it got higher at 7, possibly, and then maybe at pH 9, it was starting to get lower. So this is what maybe we should see, something like... Come on, Bowser. Right, something like that, maybe, is what I'm thinking, that we might have seen. Okay? Um, I can't guarantee that again for your results, but... Um, just to kind of bring it back to the the less the theory lesson that we had on the factors, we really um, this is essentially the data that we were collecting, and those graphs that you see, this is how the data is generated to eventually get those graphs. Okay, um, and yes, this where, wherever this peak uh, meets, uh, you know, corresponds on the x-axis, then that would be the optimum pH and as we go away from the optimum pH we're thinking about you know uh, with high pHs we're thinking about OH concentration being high with very low pHs we're thinking about H plus ions uh, concentration being high affecting the tertiary structure so that affects complementary uh, binding with the substrate and therefore possibly the um, rate of reaction. Guys, so um, good luck with this.